you very much, Klaus. That was fascinating. I must say, I felt very heartened by the charts I saw up there that showed that in basically Europe is going in the right direction in terms of your fiscal balances and so on and so forth. So maybe I'll go and buy some European shares after this. <laughs> uh, but I have, uh, I have two questions and then maybe we'll throw the floor open. Uh, the first one is, you know, we read in the media that, you know, while you have effectively uh, how do you say, uh, carried out solidarity and you, in helping other European countries and so on and so forth. But the sense of solidarity within Europe has actually diminished after the crisis and the political parties that are anti-Europe are becoming stronger and the, 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 how do you say, the hunger or desire for greater European integration is much less than it used to be politically. So in a sense, uh, my question to you is this, uh, has in fact this crisis damaged the sense of solidarity that used to be one of Europe's strengths? Yeah. Um, it's a good question because there are many developments one can interpret in different ways. So first one is to get the facts right and when I go to Greece and Portugal and these countries, many people are not aware how much solidarity there has been mm -hmm. from the rest of Europe. Um, that's why I advertise this table that I showed you. The numbers are staggering. Mm -hmm. um, so one needs to talk more about that, explain mm -hmm. better that that countries really benefit. They are not only making sacrifices, and the sacrifices are mainly done because something went wrong before. Yeah. Um, otherwise, they wouldn't have to do it. Um, but in exchange, they do get a lot, indeed a lot of solidarity when we finance about half the total public Greek debt is in my books already, mm. and we refinance it at 0.8%. Um, the IMF would take 5% mm. if Greek Greece went to the markets at the moment, they are not able to do it, but um, otherwise they would have to pay 7-8%. So that's a big, big savings. So solidarity is there, one needs to explain it better. Um, another part is, how much is this a global phenomenon that um, people are fed up with the old elites, the old establishment? We see it in the US, we see it also in the UK, where the head of the Labour Party is um, probably more radical than Bernie Sanders. Um, you see it in Switzerland, where the um, right-wing conservatives um, are the biggest party, Mr. Blocher. So it's not something that's only in, in the EU or Euro area. It seems to be a wider mm. phenomenon, and one has to try to understand it, um, what is really the cause. Um, it, it may not have so much to do with the euro as such. Hmm. Um, still it leaves the question how much are people prepared to continue um, with European integration. What is encouraging is that despite all this turmoil, crisis and, and sacrifices in some countries, the support for the euro is um, going up. Um, latest polls um, indicate that 70-75% of the people want the euro. And particularly striking in countries that went through all the adjustment, like Greece, at 75%. Um, Even in Greece? Greece. But 70% is also the average for the euro area. So people are prepared to make these sacrifices. They don't want to go back to national currencies, and which in a way is also a symbol for national policies then. Um, so there are problems. One has to be careful. Um, there is a little bit this um, fatigue and um, um, unhappiness with old elites and the establishment, but I see that also um, in other parts of the world, not only in the Euro area. Yeah. So my, my second question is, you know, it's clear that um, in the last five years there's been a major turnaround and uh, Europe is doing better and so on and so forth. But my understanding is that if you talk to young people in Europe and you ask them, uh, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, will you be better off? Or if you ask parents in Europe, will my children see a significant improvement in their lives in as much as I have seen? The, the, the answer is, generally speaking, no. 
that the young people don't, in Europe don't feel optimistic for the future. So how do you inject more optimism into the young people of Europe? So first point again, it's not a European phenomenon. Yeah. I think you have the same in the US and Japan. Hmm. Um, and partly, of course, is also related to the standard of living reached today. Hmm. Um, when I grew up in the 50s, it was much easier for my parents to say that I will be better off one day, because hmm. that was still the post-World War II. That's because they knew how smart you were. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> But it was pretty widespread. <laughs> <laughs> and it was easy to see as we were coming out of the war times. Um, mm. So that's much more difficult. The standard of living has become so yeah. high. Yeah. Um, and growth rates will be lower in the future than they were in the past. Yeah. Um, I think one has to get used to that. But with the right policies, growth will still be there. Yeah. And um, it will all depend on productivity, of course. Mm. Um, but there is technological progress. Um, um, it will, uh, will, we will continue to see growth, um, but it will not be as strong as, as in the past. Mm. So, and it's not only in Europe, it's really a, a global phenomenon for advanced economies. In Europe, the key thing is to work on the unemployment numbers, which yeah. are particularly high in those countries that went through all the, right. the adjustments the last five years. We see good progress. Um, I mentioned Ireland. Um, where the unemployment rate has fallen from 15 to 10 percent. In Spain, where unemployment traditionally is very high, but um, last year alone, employment growth was 3 percent in only mm. one year. And correspondingly, the unemployment rate is also dropping. Um, and one probably has to do even a bit more for the younger people. Um, so I think that's the biggest point. Good education and then making sure they get a job. Mm. I think that is the key. Great. Okay, questions, please. One and two. Hello, Mr. Riegling. I'm Roman Skorzos, a German second semester student here in the MPP program. And first of all, I want to say Lucky you. thank you so much that you're here. I think I would never meet you in Europe. Uh, so it's <laughs> nice that I need to come to Singapore to meet you. Now we're going to charge you for this. <laughs> um, Dean Mabubani is always talking about pragmatism, that this was a key of the success for Singapore. And I love your pragmatism, and this is so nice. And uh, that's why I want to ask you, how was it for you dealing with this highly emotional and ideologic conditions at the peak of the crisis when um, Ms. Merkel was in the same room with Mr. Farfakis? How was it for you as a pragmatic leader of a pragmatic institution? Okay, can I take a couple more questions, if you don't mind? Yeah? Sure. Okay, uh, the gentleman over there, you have raise your hand and then, yeah. Hello, Mr. Regling. Uh, uh, so, um, Filippo Di Mauro from the European Central Bank. Can you Bank. introduce yourself to... Uh, sorry. Yeah, Filippo Di Mauro from the European Central oh, Bank. Say, yeah. I'm actually uh, uh, here, thank you for the hospitality, I've been here for a few months. In fact, a special thanks, because these were kind of difficult months in the sense that uh, we have something to, to be sorry about it. I mean, so credibility of Europe was a bit lost in the last few few months uh, and quarters, and of course uh, your speech was actually you know, telling us that in fact uh, maybe the worst is over and of course we have been, east on the institutional front, made a lot of steps on the right direction. So thank you very much for helping us as, uh, as patriots here to defend Europe. Two questions on, on your talk, if I may. Um, the first was on the issue of inequality. You were kind of saying that uh, you know, uh, is, is an advantage uh, a, a, a sort of be more equal in a sense. First of all, I would question a bit the, the indicators that you, that you use, but say, let's, let's, let's look at the equality that you were sort of uh, talking about with respect to Italy, for instance. There was a very low level of sort of the, the ratio that you were saying, no? between 10, you know, richest and poorest. I would argue, however, that inequality per se is not bad in the sense that uh, for the case of Italy you could argue that inequality is due to the fact that uh uh, sort of the equalities due to the fact that they say size of the firms or uh, the richest are actually too few in order to really push 
push up the economy. So in the sense uh, that uh, for the United States, the fact that you have a sort of a small, limited number of richest, in fact, is pushing the economy. So uh, my maybe question the fact whether inequality is always necessarily related to sort of lower growth and uh, to be seen negatively. Um, in economic terms, actually. The second question, which is somewhat related to that, is the fact that, of course, you have been arguing that, uh, you know, now uh, the worst is over, uh, and also the easiest part of the question was solved in the sense that it was clear that it was a, an issue of lack of competitiveness. You mentioned Unilever costs, the current account deficit. This has been readjusted with very painful measures. Now it comes the most difficult part of it, transforming the into you know a recipe for productivity enhancement and so on. On that, I would ask you. Um, uh, you mentioned labor market. You didn't mention so much product market that I think for me is extremely important. Degree of entry and exit, as well as the fact that what you think about this competitiveness sort of agency that should be kind of put together in order to. Uh, sort of coordinate the more structural policies of Europe uh, in order to push productivity up. Thanks a lot, Mr. Yeah, well, I think since we have three questions, if you don't mind, if you're aware of what, let's give Klaus a chance to respond to the one on pragmatism, inequality, and long term productivity. Yes, thank you. Otherwise, we forget. Yeah. yeah. So, thank you for your question. Congratulations to be here. Um, for both of you, actually, <laughs> <laughs> Filippo also. Um, well, it was not easy to deal with the Greeks, and you mentioned Mr. Farafakis, that was the first half of last year, and that was indeed a very special um, period, because um, after Mr. Tsipras had his first election victory, he got a mandate in that election to do everything differently, stop reforms, reverse reforms. Mr. Farafakis tried to revolutionize not only Europe, but basically the entire world, and introduce a new economic model. He was quite ambitious. Um, I had many, many meetings with him. Um, and they were sometimes emotional, but also they were really frustrating because um, two completely different worlds um, were not able to, to really get together. Um, his, his vision, his ambitions were completely different from what the rest of Europe believed. Um, and this is not only German dogmatism and Dutch conservatism. Um, I think very early on one could see when Mr. Tsipras went to Italy and, and France where also socialist governments are in power, um, he got no support basically. Um, so it was a big failure and it has cost the Greek economy a lot this first half of the year because they were on a good track already. In 2014 was the first year with positive growth in Greece. Um, unemployment began to fall in 2014. The government was able to issue bonds in the markets again. And all that came to a halt in the first half of 2015. And now Greece is slowly tr <coughs> trying to get out of that again. When Mr. Tsipras was elected in September last year for the second time, he got a completely different mandate. First time he got a mandate to change everything and stop reforms. Second time he was elected, he got the mandate to implement the agreed reform program. And that's what he's trying to do now. It's not easy, there's a slim majority in parliament, not everybody's convinced all the time, things are difficult, but basically the mandate is very clear. Together with the 75% majority of the Greeks who want to stay in the Euro area. So there were some difficult emotional uh, moments last year, um, during the first half of the year, absolutely. Um, but in, in a way, the rest of Europe knew very clearly what should be done. In that sense, um, there was no wavering. Um, and Yes, but it's in a way easier now that we see four of the five countries that were supported um, with money from the ESM and the ESF, that they are now success cases. So nobody can argue that the strategy is not working and we need something completely different. Um, we knew what works and Greece is now back on track. So um, I could tell you many more emotional moments when I started creating the institutions, but maybe we leave that for later. Filippo, on income inequality, 
I'm happy if you show me better data. I picked up what the OECD published recently. Um, of course, income inequality is not per se always bad. And that's, I think, the key words you said, not always. But when I see how it has, what's the differences between the US and Europe, um, and how it gets less um, even in in the US, the Gini coefficient is deteriorating, all the indicators, whatever indicator you take, shows that the US, um, it's getting worse. And it's on the income side, and it's even more so on the wealth side, because we know that QE works through um, wealth effects, so that's even amplified. And um, I think this is bad for society if it goes too far. Um, I'm not advocating total income equality, obviously, but I think it can go too far. And then it's also bad in the end for economic developments because the very rich people know we know have a much higher propensity to save. Um, that's why I think um, QE has not shown the full results of what some, some people hope for. So I'm much happier what I see in Europe where we also have income inequality, um, and some countries it also has become a little bit stronger, but not as much as in the US, and overall it's much more even. And I think that keeps society to, together um, um, much more easily. On, on the euro area, um, you said the easy part is done. I think the euro crisis is basically over. Um, Greece is a special case. But of course we have the other, still have, as I mentioned, on our agenda what to do to strengthen growth and bring up productivity, not in a crisis mode, and that's also why it's more difficult. The countries that went into the crisis needed money, therefore had to accept conditionality, um, were forced into adjustment. They typically do more than others. So now that we are moving out of the crisis mode, of course it's more difficult to implement structural reforms. That's always the case. Um, so it will not be easy, but economists know exactly what should be done. Um, it's often a question of explaining it well to the electorate, and in that context the competitiveness councils that have been pr um, proposed by the European Commission, I think, can also help to explain better. They will not be able to do a miracle, because the decisions have to be taken by governments and parliaments, um, but the these councils, if they work well, they can help to explain and make the case. Okay, go ahead. There's two questions. Go ahead now. I think. Uh, hello, my name is Max Sprenger. I'm intern at the EU delegation, and you said that well, because because there's a common monetary policy, countries cannot solve cannot affect that anymore. Um, but what about so how? A trade deficit can have can drive the can drive Europe apart in the long run. So Germany has had a big trade deficit for a long time. Do you think that should be addressed, and how can it be addressed? Okay. Thank you. Uh, trade surplus, I mean. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Tomo Kikuchi from uh, this school. Um, we okay. You stress that. I think one of the main lessons from the euro crisis uh, is to uh, is further integrations, and uh, we we know that uh, Europe is not equal to euro, and the notable exception is the UK. Um, it seems to me uh, very suboptimal if the eurozone is now going for further integrations and London being such an important uh, financial center also for the euro market. Uh, how, how do you see this parallel structure going forward from here and how do you, what do you think is the implication for Brexit, British exit from EU? Thank you. Yeah, I think the gentleman had one question there. Do you, you want to pose a question? My name is Dufay. I teach at NTU after teaching many years at Michigan. Um, in what I hear from Europe is that Europe is the solidarity is turning into a transfer union with the thing, largely from Northern Europe to Southern Europe. This process seems to have no end in it. Where, where do you come and when is this a two-way street instead of only a one-way street? The related to this is the remarks with the 
with the US, which I know quite well. There is also a migration going on in Europe of profession, young professionals to Asia and to the US. Nothing reverse. Very few Asians in my classes look for jobs in Europe. Many the other way. So where is the dynamic that Europe develops? I just see in the newspaper, this by the way affects Singapore too. There are hundreds if not thousands of engineers working in Silicon Valley, more almost than here. This is an environment that needs to be improved in order to rectify these imbalances. Where is your hopeful uh, prospect for these developments? Thank you. Okay, three questions. Yes, first one was on the trade surplus of Germany. Um, in the short run, it's not a big problem because um, the equivalent to the trade surplus is, of course, then um, capital flows from Germany to other countries. That actually made it possible to finance some of the problems um, during the first decade of monetary union. So in the long run, it's not so healthy. It was too easy to finance. It also means that in the end, um, those who exported the capital from Germany to Spain into housing projects, for instance, they lose money. Um, so that will correct itself. They have to take the burden. So there can be imbalances here. Um, what to do about it? Um, the recommendation from the European Commission is very, very straightforward. Germany should strengthen its domestic demand. Um, that would pull in more imports. So it's not a question of reducing exports, and certainly not artificially by making exports artificially uncompetitive. But the, the best way is to strengthen domestic demand and imports, and thereby reducing um, the trade surplus. The other point is, as I mentioned earlier, as Germany is cyclically more advanced, um, unit labor costs are and have been now growing for the last three years faster than for the euro area average, and that will also help to reduce the uh, trade surplus. Um, the, other, the next question was, um, um, you said it's suboptimal to have more integration in the euro area and less in the rest of the EU. Um, I don't see it that way. Um, I think um, the way forward is indeed to have more integration for the euro area. Um, and there will be an outer ring around this inner core of European integration. The inner core, the countries that have the euro. The outer ring are those who don't want to join the euro area, like the UK and Denmark. They have an opt-out. Some others will also wait a bit longer. Of course, they remain invited, so it's not a closed job. Um, if they want to join the inner core and meet the criteria, they are welcome. Um, the outer ring will also grow over time because more countries will join the EU, particularly the, Bo the countries on the Balkan, like um, Serbia, uh, Macedonia, but also Albania. More countries will join. It will take them quite a while before they are ready to join the euro area. So we will continue to have this two-speed Europe. We already have it. It will continue. Um, and I think that's not bad. It's important to remain open so that nobody feels um, um, left out. But if a country like the UK definitely doesn't want to join, um, they should be quite happy to be in the single market in the EU. And unless they decide sometime this year to leave. So the Brexit, I think, has become um, a risk because there's a referendum. Um, referenda are quite often unpredictable. Um, this week in Brussels, there will probably be agreement with the UK um, on a package of measures um, in order to keep the UK in the EU. Um, I also hope that the UK will stay because politically it would be very damaging for, for the EU to lose um, Great Britain because the relative importance of the EU in the world would shrink. Economically, I think it would be mainly a damage for the UK itself um, because um, a lot of investment that has been going to the UK um, is there because investors from the rest of the world want access to the single market. And if they don't get that via the UK, they will likely go directly to the continent. So this will hurt the UK. 
and the financial center London might also be affected somewhat, not completely because one can of course trade euros also outside the euro area. It also happens in, in Asia and, and in New York. Um, but there, uh, there might be a, a marginal impact on the financial center. So I hope it doesn't happen. Um, but if it were to happen, I don't see um, that it would damage the euro area. It would really damage the UK. On, on the last set of questions, um, um, I don't think we have a transfer union in, in Europe. I think you have been reading too much German newspapers that <laughs> always claim that there's a transfer union. Um, because to take one clear example, the German taxpayer has not paid one euro for the money that goes from my institution to Greece or Ireland or Spain or Portugal. They have taken risks because they guarantee my operation, but they have not paid one euro so far. So I don't call that a transfer union. Um, the solidarity is provided because these countries get their loans very cheaply. I can raise money in the markets cheaply because I have the guarantee from strong member states. Um, and, and we pass on those low funding costs directly to the countries concerned. And that's how the big budgetary savings materialize that I showed. But it's not a transfer union and the loans have to be repaid. Um, migration. Um, of course, it has never been as good as in the US, in, the Euro, in Europe, and it will never be as good as in the US because we have many different languages. That's the big advantage. If you use, everybody uses the same language as in the US, it's much easier to move from one part of the country to another. But we do have some migration. Um, we see very clearly um, since the crisis broke, Let's take again Germany as an example, that Germany since 2010 has a net inflow of people. Um, until 2009 and a number of years before, there was an annual loss in German population of two to 300,000 every year. Since 2010, there's an annual gain of two to 300,000. And this is before the migration wave that started middle of last year. So that's a swing only for Germany of half a million people. And these were people, these are people that come from southern European countries. Um, there are well-known stories that big companies like Siemens or the German railway system, they send recruiting missions to Spain to recruit staff because they couldn't find the people in Germany. So that is real migration in Europe from weaker economies to stronger economies. And most of those people will go back one day when the Spanish economy recovers. They will remember that there's a lot more sunshine in Spain than in Germany. <laughs> and um, that's a strong pull factor. Um, so there's some migration, um, but it's not like the US, and I think we will never achieve that. Let me conclude with a very difficult question for you. <laughs> uh, you know, the United States enjoys a very special position with this global reserve currency. Uh, is the only country that can print bank notes to pay off his loans, you know. That's a great privilege. Now, for that reason, I think the United States was never very comfortable about the Euro project because it was a potential threat to their position as a custodian of the global reserve currency. So when this crisis happened, do you think the United States wanted to see the Euro succeed or fail? No. <laughs> no, I have a very clear view on that. Um, <laughs> Um, the U.S. didn't want the euro to disappear. <laughs> Maybe a few hedge funds in Wall Street um, were, were <laughs> betting on that and trying to make money out of that. But those who tried actually lost a lot of money. Mm. And those who, who believed in the euro could actually make a lot of money. Um, and that is a, is a valuable experience. But, but that, that's a short-term thing. What about the long-term thing? But the government, um, so the authorities in the U.S. have been very supportive. They partly out of self-interest. If the euro area had broken up, it would have created real turmoil in the world economy. So they didn't like that. They wanted to avoid that. But also in general, I think when we when we designed monetary union in the 90s and it started, the U.S. government was quite supportive. So mm. so I I don't detect there any second thoughts. And um, also we made it always clear that. We hope with the Euro, and I think we are on a good way, we will move the world and the global financial system to a multi 
polar system with three or four strong important currencies. The dollar will always be the most important one. We, are, we never tried with the euro to replace the dollar. But what we like to see is to have next to the dollar three maybe other important currencies. One will be the euro. It is the second most important currency since its creation and it continues to be in that position. The renminbi obviously will, will become a very important player in this context. Um, the yen is still important. There may be something in Latin America in one day. But it's more a multipolar system while up to let's say 10, 20 years ago it was a system based on one dominant currency, the US dollar. And I think that will not continue. Um, and the rest of the world, I think, feels more comfortable with the multipolar world, where at least we in Europe have no problem accept, accepting that the dollar remains the, the key currency. Thank you. Well, I think on that optimistic note, let's all thank uh, Klaus for his wonderful presentation. Thank you.